just a short block away over my left shoulder, a former president of the United States was arrested, arraigned on felony criminal charges. Now, it started earlier today, his journey did, outside Trump Tower. He gave a fist bump as he headed to court, and he posted on social media that it seems so surreal. Wow, they're going to arrest me. But then in the courthouse, we did see a more somber former president walking in and sitting at the defense table where the indictment was unsealed. The charges 34 counts of falsifying business records related to alleged hush money payments to two women. into a circus at times with dueling protests which had hundreds of demonstrators some of them clashed with each other cops in the media but that was really the exception rather than the rule outspoken georgia congresswoman marjorie taylor green and new york congressman george santos both showed up but they ended up leaving quickly when they were met by screaming anti-trump protesters donald trump left the courthouse he went straight to LaGuardia Airport. He boarded his plane. He is now in the air flying back to his Florida residence where he will speak tonight. As I've mentioned, we have a team of reporters covering all of these extraordinary events. We'll begin with our chief investigative reporter, Jonathan Dees, who has been out front throughout. Jonathan? Yeah, David, and we've been going over the indictment. The 34 count indictment are felonies, and if convicted, can carry a penalty of up to anywhere from zero to four years behind bars. The indictment was unsealed after Trump's not guilty plea at today's hearing. The indictment itself reads, the people of the state of New York against Donald J. Trump. The 34 counts are for falsifying business records in the first degree. And records allegedly falsified include invoices, vouchers, checks, and ledger entries. All of this, prosecutors say, was part of a conspiracy by Donald Trump to commit state campaign finance violations to try to benefit his 2016 campaign. Prosecutors also say Trump likely violated tax laws and federal campaign limits. These alleged other crimes make the business record charges a felony, not a misdemeanor. All part of the alleged 130,000 hush money scheme to Stormy Daniels, the porn star who says she had a sexual affair with Trump. Trump denies any affair and any wrongdoing. The DA's office says it was also the so-called catch and kill scheme with the publisher of the National Enquirer to try to stop negative stories from coming out, including payments as part of the overall alleged conspiracy that included payments to Stormy Daniels, to a second woman, and also a doorman a doorman who is threatening to try to sell an unverified allegation. The DA says it was a conspiracy that lasted month after month, before and after Trump was elected in 2016. Trump pleaded not guilty, and he has said Bragg, a Democrat, is attacking him to hurt his upcoming election chances. And Trump's defense lawyers say the effort was to save Trump for personal embarrassment that this was not part of any sort of campaign fraud scheme. Bragg says the indictment shows the sort of white-collar crime falsifying records is that it's a serious offense, and he says it's prosecuted in New York and all kinds of other cases. But this case is a first, and defense lawyers saying they will soon be moving to have these charges dismissed in the weeks and months ahead. David. Chief investigative reporter Jonathan Deese. So only about 250 people were in the courtroom, 50 of them members of the media. One of them, our own government affairs reporter, Melissa Russo, who truly was in the room where it happened, which, of course, refers to another historical moment. But this was one. I just want to get your observations first. You've covered arraignments. I've covered them. But this was no regular this arraignment. This was no garden variety arraignment. Usually it would take 5, 10 minutes, 15 at most, boilerplate. It's not a place where the two sides air their cases, their arguments. They don't make opening statements. This was a little bit different. First of all, you could hear a pin drop when President, former President Trump walked into that room. I want to describe his mood. Mm -hmm. um, he did not look smug. He has said he's willing to fight. He did not look in a fighting mood when he walked into that courtroom. He appeared serious, 
reflective, looking down at times as he walked around. He walked in slowly. There was some serious security in that courtroom. I've covered a number of cases over the years. I counted at various points 19, 20 court officers in the room, not counting Secret Service stationed in the four corners of the courtroom. And each row of journalists, and consider that we had to go through a vetting process, two sets of magnetometers, just to get into that courtroom, we still each, each row of five, had one court officer assigned to just watch us, watching us sit there, take notes. I mean, it was very different. And Melissa, I just want to ask you something else, because I think it struck you and others that, aside from the procedural moments for the actual charges, it was wondered whether the social media posts of the president would get the attention of prosecutors. It certainly did, and this led to some spirited uh, back and forth, right? It did. So the judge asked whether either side had anything to say, and the prosecutors immediately raised the issue of President Trump's social media posts, the World War III reference, the death and destruction reference, um, the fact that he has made references to public officials. It was a, he, They didn't mention Alvin Bragg's name, the DA, but he was actually seated in the front row observing. Right. But the the fact that uh, Trump had also mentioned Bragg's family members. And they stopped short of asking for a gag order, but they did say that these were um, serious, uh, concerning, uh, they were very seriously concerned about the danger these statements posed to this city. The Trump team defended itself, saying, look, this is someone who's running for re-election. He has rights to free speech. He feels very frustrated and upset about what's happening in this courtroom today. He thinks it's very unfair. And the judge said, look, you do have free speech rights. We take those very seriously. And even if I had been asked to issue a gag order today, I would not have done it. However, later, after being handed images by the prosecution of some of Mr. Trump's posts, yes. he said, if I see more things like this in the future, I'm going to have to take a closer look. All right, just a day of extraordinary moments. We're going to hear more from you and what you witnessed, witnessed your history inside the courtroom. Now, you mentioned DA Alvin Bragg was in the courtroom. He just wrapped up a news conference where he heard a little bit more about his thinking. Andrew Siff is covering that for us. Andrew, tell us more about what the district attorney had to say just a few moments ago. Right. It's notable that District Attorney Alvin Bragg spoke at all, because for weeks and weeks there was so much speculation about what was the grand jury doing, what was Alvin Bragg thinking, and then today, following the arraignment, he finally spoke out. Now, first, as you guys have indicated, Donald Trump entered court just after 2.30 p.m. The arraignment lasted about an hour, and as Melissa indicated, that's longer than inspected, in part because the prosecution not only explained some of what's in the indictment, but also there was that argument that you guys just referenced over whether Trump has used threatening rhetoric on social media. As for the indictment itself, the 34 counts of falsifying business records, D.A. Alvin Bragg a short time ago explaining his reasoning. Under New York state law, it is a felony to falsify business records with intent to defraud and an intent to conceal another crime. That is exactly what this case is about. 34 false statements made to cover up other crimes. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. Today's unsealing of this indictment shows that the rule of law died in this country. Because ev while everyone is not above the law, no one's below it either. And if this man's name was not Donald J. Trump, there is no scenario we'd all be here today. Please understand that based on these charges. Now, worth mentioning, I was in an overflow courtroom where you could watch the proceedings on a television monitor, got to see Donald Trump's face the entire time. Sometimes he crossed his arms like this. He had a serious expression the whole time. Some of the folks in the courtroom itself were behind Mr. Trump and as a result couldn't always see his face. And that was actually addressed to the judge. There had been an application from the media for television coverage throughout the proceedings. That was denied. We're live in lower Manhattan. Andrew Siff, News 4 New York. Okay, Andrew, thank you. I'm joined now by Robert Gottlieb. He's going to be with us throughout our coverage through the newscast, but a veteran prosecutor and also a defense attorney for white collar crimes. You started in that very building. Uh, we got about 90 seconds for this uh, particular hit. Just give us your overall sense now that you've heard what the DA has said and what you've seen. Frankly, I'm surprised. I thought there was going to be more. It's only falsifying business records. And we all heard over the last few weeks that in order for it to be a felony, 
it would have to be involved in intent to defraud, to cover up, or to commit another crime. So everybody has been wondering, what the heck is that other crime? As it turns out, in each of the counts, which only cover specific ledger entries or regarding 11 checks, while it, it references that it, the falsified business records to commit another crime, but it never mentions what the other crime is. So as we stand here right now, yeah. we don't know if the other crime is election law. We don't know if it's state election law. And in fact, I thought uh, there would be some allegation of tax fraud. In fact, in D.A. Bragg's statement, statement, apparently he makes reference that this was part for tax purposes because they said that all of these checks were for legal services, which everybody knows was just, just a lie. Yet nowhere in the uh, indictment uh, do, do they specify. That raises a very clear issue. You can That's what I want to ask you. Motions. Where would you start with motions to dismiss? The first motion, I'm sure, is going to On be what the defense is going to say, what is the underlying crime? Is it federal election law? Because if it's federal election law, we know there's going to be a motion that the state DA doesn't have discretion to prosecute based on a federal. Is it a state election law? Is it a banking fraud? Is it a tax fraud? The, uh, the defense is entitled to that information. That, I'm sure, will be the first motion out of the box. Okay. Robert got a lot of complicated issues are going to help us get through them. So that's where it stands here. I just want to share a few thoughts here. It's relatively calm now. There were crowds, as we reported earlier. Before things locked down, I tried to get a sense of that park across from the courthouse just to get a feel for it because we haven't seen this before. I walked through. I talked to a couple of New Yorkers. I met one who really had no partisan game or dog in this fight. He said, I really don't care about that. He is concerned that the DA is spending so much time on this and not crime in New York, but he did want to be here and witness it. And I did see the upper echelons of the NYPD brass first. Deputy Commissioner Ed Caban and Chief of Department Jeff Madry here on the scene as well. But really not a tense moment. There were some pro, some anti, some here who come for any cause whenever there's an event like this. So, Natalie, that's where we stand on an extraordinary day mm -hmm. in New York City. We'll see you right. too. David Ushery leading our coverage there outside of court. We will see you again soon. Dave, thank you so much for that. And as he said, while all eyes were on Manhattan today for Trump's first criminal indictment, it might not be his last because he's currently the target of three investigations. One, the January 6th insurrection. The federal probe appears to be focusing on Trump's role in the Capitol attack, on attempts by him and his allies to recruit fake presidential electors in key states, and on their fundraising off of false voter fraud claims. Number two, we'll talk about Georgia. You might remember that infamous phone Phone call of Trump pushing the state's top elections officials to find 11,780 votes. A grand jury has recommended charges against multiple people. It's unclear, though, whether Trump is among them. Now the third case involves the handling of classified documents and the materials seized from Mar-a-Lago. So a lot still ahead. Remember, you can count on News 4 to bring you the latest on all these developments on air, online, our free app, and our streaming channel. 